Computer Science and Engineering Colloquia features accessible talks by leading computer scientists and computer engineers from across the region and around the world. Good afternoon, everybody. It's my pleasure to introduce um, Burr Settles. Um, he got his PhD from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, an expert in machine learning. In fact, wrote uh, sort of the textbook on active learning. Um, he uh, uh, had a chance to interact with him quite a bit when he was doing a postdoc at Carnegie Mellon University in the Nell Project. Um, and after that, he's joined Duolingo, and I'm really excited to hear about uh, his adventures there. So without further ado. All right, thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me. Hello, everyone. I promise I don't bite. You, there are empty seats in the front. You can come down. OK. Um, yeah, so uh, I've been at Duolingo for about three years or so. And just uh, out of curiosity, as a show of hands, who is familiar with Duolingo in the room? Oh, that's a good percentage. How, who's actually used Duolingo to learn another language? Uh, Who's actually finished a course on Duolingo? <laughs> OK. <laughs> OK. Well, today I'll talk about some of the work that I've done to drive those numbers up. Um, so but, so this, this slide may be superfluous, uh, since most everybody raised their hand. But Duolingo is about, uh, right now we've got about 130 million students uh, across the world, uh, learning a variety of languages. Currently, we have about 50 courses covering 25 languages. Uh, so, not all of the all the courses are to learn a lang language from another language. So, we don't have the full complement of all 25 of those. So, for example, we have a course for Chinese speakers to learn English, but not yet a course for English speakers to learn Chinese. For a long time, that was true of Russian too. Until yesterday, we finally launched the Russian for English. Uh, speakers course, so in case you were waiting for that. Um, we're expanding to 78 soon. We're, we're, we're working on up to 78, include, including Klingon. Um, believe it or not, there are enough uh, dedicated volunteers to help us uh, build that course. We have an Esperanto course uh, and Irish Gaelic. There are, in fact, more people learning Irish Gaelic through Duolingo than there are native speakers of Irish Gaelic. So the, the courses are available uh, as native apps on Android, iOS, and Windows Phone, as well as a website. And it's 100% free. And how it can be free uh, was inspired originally by this thing. So what, what's this called? A CAPTCHA, that's right. <laughs> and uh, and uh, it, one of the inventors of the CAPTCHA was my boss. Uh, Luis Van On, who uh, this particular version of a CAPTCHA is reCAPTCHA. Uh, who knew that you're actually digitizing books when you're filling these things out? All right. So for those of you who didn't raise your hand, how it works is one of those words is known by this computer security system, and the other one is an OCR scan that it's not confident about. And so what happens is you type in both words, it checks you against the word that it did know, and then after maybe 10 independent people type in the same thing for the other word, then it's considered uh, digitized and it moves on to other things. So there's this uh, twofold, you're providing a security mechanism as well as providing a service uh, by digitizing books. And uh, just as, a, as an interesting diversion, sometimes when you're picking two random words, funny things happen, like one poor person on a support page saw this and waited for an hour. <laughs> before finally calling tech support and asking what to do next. Uh, or sometimes you run the risk of being offensive by juxtaposing adjectives <laughs> next to nouns. What was, the, the real kicker here is that this was a church website. Uh, or during the last presidential campaign uh, on Jan John Edwards' website. So but anyway, it's estimated that uh, more than a billion people have actually contributed to digitizing books through reCAPTCHAs. And it turns out even more people in the world are trying to learn another language. Uh, most of those people are learning English, and most of those people are uh, trying to learn to better their job prospects or, or better their lives in some way, uh, perhaps to move uh, to a different country where that language is spoken, uh, or, or to have jobs in the service industry, tourism. 
uh, sector, so on and so forth. So this gave rise to the idea that there's a need for translation of documents. Most of the internet is in English, shackled up and unavailable for uh, speakers of other languages. And there's a billion people who speak these other languages uh, that are trying to learn some other language, many of them learning English. So is there a way that we can harness these and put them together and actually teach people a language and as a byproduct of their learning exercises, uh, crowdsource the translations of documents that we can sell for revenue to subsidize the free education. So it's kind of like this uh, 21st century distributed um, apprenticeship system or something like that that you can think of. Uh, and along the way, we've, we've been pretty popular. The, uh, it's consistently one of the top ranked education apps in both the Google Play and iOS app stores. Uh, and we've gotten various awards from both Google and Apple and uh, TechCrunch. And there was a study a few years ago looking at English speakers learning Spanish. And uh, the results of this estimated that it takes about 34 hours of using Duolingo to reach the proficiency that you would be uh, at the end of a first semester university course in Spanish, which takes more than 34 hours of work when you factor everything in. So uh, these are all promising and exciting. Uh, our overall approach as a company, so it was spun off of a research project at Carnegie Mellon University. Many of us have a research background. And so we prefer to take a scientific and data-driven approach to designing and improving Duolingo. So this in includes machine learning, natural language processing, and of course, educational psychology and, and psychometrics, and trying to marry all of these things together. Um, and it's also one of our kind of core opinions or core competencies and uh, philosophies to uh, so when we were designing the courses, uh, we would read a lot of stuff from the second language acquisition literature and educational psychology. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of empirical work that's done, or when it is, it's done on small groups of about 30 people in a classroom setting and not uh, on a large scale. Um, so most of the work is kind of theoretical or argument-based. And so we've taken the philosophy of picking and choosing things that we think are tractable and realistic hypotheses, and then implementing them with the software system that we have, and actually running experiments and improving uh, the platform empirically. Uh, so there's a lot of different projects that I could talk about. Uh, I'm going to focus on these three today. If you have questions about any of the others, we can discuss them at the end. Uh, but I'll talk about a, a machine learning model for spaced repetition practice a computer adaptive placement test that I developed a couple of years ago, which then evolved into an entirely new product called uh, Duolingo Test Center that I've been working on for the last couple of years. Do you need approval from people to do experiments on them? <laughs> IRB <laughs> approval? Um, so, no. <laughs> uh, it, in, in a sense, I mean, we haven't done any experiments that I would consider even as... Um, uh, iffy as, as like the, big, the famous f Facebook experiment a few years ago uh, you know, for the, the sentiment of, of different posts and things like that. Um, uh, we have cooperated for some of the studies that we've done in collaboration uh, with outside researchers gone through the IRB approval process for those. But uh, for a lot of the experiments that I'm presenting today, for example, no. Okay, so spaced repetition, uh, the general idea is that people tend to learn things or recall things better if you practice them over spaced intervals instead of cramming. So for those of you who are students in the room, if you're cramming the night before the test, you might do well the next day on the test, but if you were given that same test two weeks later, you would not do as well as if you'd just been regularly studying all along. Uh, and and uh, there's also some evidence that the intervals with which you practice things uh, should be spaced out longer and longer over time the more you practice them. So Duolingo uses these strength bars uh, to indicate when, uh, ignore the, the word lexemes, but like words or, excuse me, grammatical concepts uh, need to be practiced. So the, the course itself is organized into this tree. Actually, let me break out of this. So this is, for example, my Spanish skill tree. Uh, we organize things into uh, different skills that unlock, so I haven't, this is as far as I've gone so far in the, the Spanish language skill tree. Uh, and these different strength bars indicate things that need practice. I haven't practiced in a while, so most everything needs practice. In 
uh, if it's something that you've recently learned or have practiced uh, a lot, uh, those skills would be gold, and then over time, uh, things degrade. And what's actually happening here is that we have a model that predicts the probability that you'll get an arbitrary exercise correct of the content that we would present at that, in that particular skill at that particular point in the tree, given your history with the course. Um, and so that's the model that I'm going to talk about right now. And it's, it's based on the idea of a forgetting curve. So the probability of getting an answer correct is, or correctly recalling some fact is a function of the time it's been since you last practiced it and the half-life of that particular concept in your declarative memory. Uh, so if, let's say we have a hypothetical half-life of one day. If one day has elapsed, there's a 50-50 chance that you'll properly recall it. But if you just practiced it, it's almost 100%. Uh, however, if it's been a week, uh, the probability is pretty low. OK, so this, this is fine and makes sense. But there's kind of a, a problem. How do you measure the half-life of you know, a word or a concept in your brain? Uh, so one proposal, uh, and this is actually what was implemented in the Duolingo system at the time that I, I joined, was the Leitner flashcard algorithm. There are many different variations of it, but one standard implementation is, uh, let's say you're studying flashcards and you've got all these different boxes with numbers. Everything starts out in the, the one day box. And you review those flashcards and for everything you get correct, you move into the two day box. Uh, and then two days later, you review all of those. And if you got those correct, they go in the four-day box. If you got it incorrect, then it goes back in the one-day box. You know, pretty simple spaced repetition kind of algorithm. Uh, so I notice that you can formalize this idea into the equation of just two to the power of the number of times you got it right minus the number of times you got it wrong. And this could be further generalized into uh, just a parameterized model where it's two to the power of some dot product where you've got some features uh, that describe your history or interaction with this particular concept and then a parameter of vectors, uh, or a vector of parameters uh, that are just linear weights uh, on this. And so now we have kind of a way of estimating this half-life that we can indirectly estimate given actual user traces uh, of things that are correct and incorrect. So we have a lot of detailed data. So uh, for example, this is a listening exercise where you listen to an audio clip and you type in what you heard. Uh, in this French exercise, Lacteur, this is correct. Uh, we're also somewhat lenient with accents. So if you miss an accent, we'll still give it to you as correct. But the fact that we detected the missing accent is a feature that we could then throw into the, the uh, half-life algorithm. Uh, typos are another thing. If, who, who in the room has studied German, is an English speaker and studied German? Yeah. So those long compound words, there's a lot of chance for typos uh, in the case system. Um, so those are things that could be correct. Uh, here are the types of things we can detect as incorrect. Uh, perhaps you use the wrong tense, you know, the wrong conjugation. Uh, if you, for languages that have genders, you use the wrong gender. Uh, or maybe you just use the wrong uh, case uh, or the wrong word completely. Question? How, how do you know the difference between a typo and someone getting it incorrect? Uh, so it's a pretty simplistic algorithm. Right now, it's just it's based on edit distance. As long as the edit distance is within a window and what you typed in is not a, an actual word in the language. Uh, that's a great question. So we have this, this trace of everything that the users have gotten right and everything the users have gotten wrong. And can we learn to predict this accurately uh, with a half-life regression? So here's uh, basically a form of what the optimization problem is. We have uh, a log of whether or not the exercise was correct, the probability that it would be predicted as correct according to this half-life uh, model, and then a regularization term to just prevent overfitting. Uh, and uh, we've, we fit this with stochastic gradient descent using a week of log data, which at that time was only 13 million student word pairs. Uh, now it's, it's sufficiently larger than that, I, I would imagine. It would be fun to go back and uh, redo this experiment. So here are some results. Uh, for the, at the time we did this, we only had these eight courses to learn English from Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese, and also for English speakers to learn French, German, Spanish, Italian, and Portuguese. Uh, and the, the Leitner flashcard system was essentially doing random guessing, uh, whereas the, the regression was able to cut 
the error rates in half. And this is a really fuzzy and difficult problem because there's all uh, kinds of reasons that somebody might uh, get something wrong. Um, so it's kind of exciting that we were able to make these kinds of gains. Now, th this was an offline experiment training on about 12 million uh, instances and then predicting on the, the next 1 million in an actual time series. What were the features? So uh, originally, we threw in kind of the kitchen sink of features. Uh, so there were number of times correct, number of times incorrect. There were indicator variables for the, the, the different words or concepts, the, the users. Um, things like the empirical word frequency of that, like, that word in a corpus. Uh, and we were actually able to get error rates lower than this originally. Um, let me come back to that after this next slide because what we wanted to do was see if, okay, we can get better predictions in this offline experiment, but does it make any difference to user behavior in practice? Um, the reason we were even looking at this is because we got so many complaints about the word strength, the error, the, the decay bars not measuring, not being consistent with, with what the users thought uh, they should be. So we ran a controlled experiment where half of our users got the old Lightner flashcard system and half of them got this uh, new uh, regression-based approach and ran the experiment for six weeks and the result was we saw 1.7% increase uh, in day after day recurring retention, so people who practiced on one day and then came back and also were using Duolingo the next day. Okay, so back to your question about the features. When we, th when we threw all of these features at it originally, uh, we were actually able to get lower error rates. And we saw the these same patterns, but we were also getting complaints uh, for some users that no matter how much they practiced a particular word or skill, they just had to practice it again the next day because it was kind of overfitting to the lowest common denominator of our students. And so, for example, uh, the case system is generally hard for English speakers learning German. So it didn't matter how well you knew the case system or how often you practiced it, you were being drilled on the same things day after day. So we actually, in the spirit of Occam's razor, started paring back uh, the feature set till we could get still pretty significant gains in the predictions, uh, but it was a much simpler model. And here's an actual user trace uh, of a student. So you can see what the model does very quickly. It's decaying right after they learn. Uh, an exercise, they get it correct. It decays a little slower. They get it wrong, so it decays faster again. Uh, and then over the course of, I guess, two months, they, uh, they practiced it seven or eight times. And you can see how the strength bar, the rate at which it decays there. So there are any, any other questions about the spaced repetition? Models for different words? So it's one model, but the, the, the features that we use are <clears throat> the cross product of the user and the concept. So, so the features that we use are specific to the, you know, that tuple of the user and the, and the word. How much does this sort of thing generalize across languages, given that you have consistent from a two language. Right, so the model is actually trained uh, with all languages together. And so I showed that how the error rates were pretty much consistent across the different language courses, at least at that time. And we haven't actually done any work as we introduce new uh, language courses. We haven't really had a, felt a need to go back and revisit this. It would be interesting to, but. So when I use Duolingo, what, how many bars left should I like practice? Or should I just wait for it to tell me to practice? Ah, so this is another interesting thing. We, we kind of lie to you a little bit about the rate at which it decays. So originally, there was another controlled experiment we ran shortly after this one, <clears throat> where originally two out of four bars was at 50%. You know, we would just round it. Um, it turns out people really wanted to keep their, skill, their, their trees gold. Uh, and the optimal time to practice is at about 50%, theoretically anyway. Um, but people were practicing it as soon as it dropped below 75%, which takes a lot of time. So we, we actually ran a controlled experiment where we showed you, in one condition, the, uh, the actual prediction and another the square root of the prediction, uh, which means that you would drop to about three bars out of four 
when in reality the prediction is roughly about 0.5. Uh, and that improved uh, engagement even more. So we'll do one more before moving on. Did you compare your approach to any other like simple flashcard algorithms? For instance, Anki uses um, a kind of similar thing. Right. So so Anki's is a bit more complex and sophisticated, and that would be a fun thing to do to take basically the the super memo algorithm and then parameterize it the same way that we parameterize the Lightner system. Uh, we looked at a variety of other kind of flash card, al card algorithms in the offline experiments, um, but this worked the best. But we haven't compared against some variant of SuperMemo. Another experiment, so here's this quote from Confucius that says, it does not matter how slowly you go as long as the, you do not stop. And the problem uh, at this time in Duolingo's history is a lot of people were stopping. You know, they would get started, and one of the reasons um, that people would stop is maybe you already had four years of high school French, and you come in, and you didn't really want to start at lesson one of basics one of French, and you were kind of forced to do that with Duolingo at that time. Uh, so what we wanted to do was create a quick, efficient, computer-adaptive placement test that could, in five minutes or so, figure out where you belonged in the curriculum. Uh, and so that, that's what I worked on. So here's a cartoon of what the skill tree might look like. And the goal is to quickly determine how deep in the skill tree you belong, where to unlock the skill tree. So using the mass of computer science knowledge that's in this room, does anybody have a guess of like a first approach? Binary search. Binary search. <laughs> Why not that? So if we have a binary search, yeah, start in the middle. Let's say you got it correct. Skip down, incorrect, zoom, zoom, back and forth until you zero in on uh, you know, where you get everything right, transitions to where you get everything wrong, and we'll unlock the tree up to that point. So does anybody see a problem with this? Uh, what if, for instance, you, could, you do get something right way down deep in the tree, but you fail on something earlier? Yeah, so in practice, this is a really noisy problem. So you could know the material and just have a brain fart, and get it wrong, or you could not know the material and you just got a really easy uh, question and you guessed and got it right. Um, or it could be that our curriculum is imperfect and it's not actually kind of linear. Uh, and, and so instead, what we want to do is find the best place where if we unlocked you up to here, you'll know almost everything above and hopefully almost none of what's below. Uh, so uh, the approach that we turn to is item response theory. Who, who in the room is familiar with item response theory here? Wow, quite a few hands. This is, uh, in a computer science audience, I've only had one other talk where somebody raised their hand, so this is kind of cool. Um, okay, so the, the basic 101 version uh, of this is you have an item response function. Uh, in our case, we'll have exercises have a depth D, where they would typically uh, be introduced to the, the user. And students have a latent trait uh, ability variable theta. And one particular item response function we could use is just the logistic function. So the difference between the depth and the user's ability uh, run through the logit function will give us a probability. Uh, so let's see if the, if the user really belongs at level five and we have a, a depth five exercise, there's a 50-50 chance that you'll get it correct. If it's an easier exercise, shallower in the tree, uh, then that increases the probability that you would get it correct. Um, tracing up the middle there. And if it's deeper, then that decreases the probability that you would get it correct. So given a set of exercises at different points in the tree, uh, the, the, the place, to, the theta, you know, the place to unlock is the one that maximizes uh, this likelihood function. And so our iterative algorithm is to estimate the depth using the current test items and then select the next uh, depth to choose. So this is kind of like an active learning problem where you're searching through the space. So as a cartoon, uh, let's say we start out with some prior distribution. Uh, so this is the log likelihood of a normal prior centered at, uh, at, at row one. So we'll just go ahead and ask a question at level one, to get that particular exercise right. And this is what the, the likelihood shape uh, updates to. So where should we ask a question 
next? Which row? So the second row is one possible solution. Uh, there's also this kind of, as typical in an active learning problem, there's an exploration exploitation trade-off. So we could be picking that row because that's the most likely um, depth. We can also estimate error bars over, uh, over these likelihood estimations. Uh, and so maybe we actually want to ask a question with the highest maximal, you know, when you account the, for the likelihood and the variance in that estimation. And so we've tried both in simulation and in practice a bunch of different algorithms, and this one seems to work pretty well. Uh, so over time, you know, we've gone down this, this far. Now we actually want to backtrack uh, and keep asking questions. After about eight questions, this is what it looks like. So we have a few, you know, this, this exercise down here that we got wrong, probably should have gotten it right. Uh, and then finally, by the end of the test, after about five minutes, uh, we'll stop once the error bar becomes sufficiently small on the most likely uh, depth, and then unlock the tree up to that point. So this is the fundamentals of the, the computer adaptive placement test. And uh, we also ran this as a, like a controlled experiment, where half the people got no option and half the people got an option. Ran this for 12 weeks, and part of the reason we ran it so long is we were focused particularly at new students, because these are the people who even have the option for the placement test, and we wanted to see how it affected their engagement. So we saw a 1.3 increase in the number of new students who came back and continued to learn on Duolingo the next day. Um, what's also interesting is there are some, there's a trade-off maybe between short-term and long-term gains. So maybe we placed them out of half the tree and they were really excited about that, so they came back the next day, but we really placed them too far and it was too hard. Uh, and so in the long term they dropped out. And so we were pleasantly surprised to see uh, that with this particular change, uh, the, we saw even bigger gains for people coming back two weeks later. Um, so are there any, any questions about this? What would be the smallest difference that you would that you would be excited about? You mean in, in terms of these? Yeah, like magnitude. Maybe half a percent. These are relative uh, improvements. So it's, it's, it's actually really, uh, I, I know that may not sound like much, but when you're having you know, several million people a day perhaps using it, then a 1% increase is actually a large fraction of the people who are coming back. Okay, oh wait, one more. So do you just test one placement algorithm or did you look at multiple ones in the same time? So we've, yeah, we've done lots of experimentation with different variations of the algorithms um, and th this is just an overview of the overall approach. Um, do, you, do you change your model or rearrange your tree at all um, based on these sorts of experiments? Yeah, we do. Um, so if there's time at the end of the talk, the question was, I forgot, I was told I was supposed to repeat the question. So uh, do we rearrange the actual curriculum as a result of the various things that we learn? Um, I, I can talk a little bit about that at the end or offline if there's time. <coughs> okay, so an interesting thing happened about this time. So we built this computer adaptive uh, testing framework. Um, we also, around that time, had students who had completed or gotten sufficiently far in the tree asking us for some way to certify uh, what they had learned. Like many of them actually, uh, particularly in Latin America, people learning English were able to get better jobs, move from a janitor position to a waiter position, for example, at a restaurant. Um, and several companies also started contacting us uh, with needs of inexpensively assessing the English ability of their crowd workers. For example, Odesk, which is now Upwork, uh, reached out to us. Uh, as well as call centers and some various other uh, companies. And we we're also looking for additional revenue models. So the idea at this point was, well, let's launch another app. Uh, so a companion app, not for learning, but for evaluating uh, language proficiency. And so that was the launch of Duolingo Test Center, which I've been working on pretty much full time from February uh, 
2014 to the present. So between September of 2013 and this time, it was kind of a 20% time uh, experimental project. And, and uh, now we've got a full-on product that launched July of 2014. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, these are some of the major players. Who in the room has taken one of the tests? These tests, OK. Who really enjoyed the process of taking this? <laughs> yeah, I saw a lot of hints quickly coming down. Um, so, so these tests are, are in the hundreds of dollar range. Uh, you actually have to go to a physical testing center uh, to take them. There may not even be one in the country where you live, or there may be one and it was sold out. Actually, so our founder, Luis Van An, when he wanted to study in the United States, uh, the test centers in Guatemala were booked through for six months, so he actually had to fly, I think, to Costa Rica to take the test and then come back for his college applications. Um, so the idea behind Test Center is to offer a test at a large scale at a much lower price point uh, and essentially have about 2 billion locations. Any internet-enabled mobile device could be a testing center for um, a language proficiency exam. So we started, oh, just to put this in context, 85%, this is from a UN report, 85% of the population has access to a mobile device compared to 64% of the world has access to indoor plumbing. So I, I was actually doing some volunteer work in Haiti this past June, and I encountered this. I, I was in a village of about 5,000 people that had four composting toilets, one latrine, and one in 20 people had an Alcatel Android phone. Uh, but, and, and they actually, they, there are entrepreneurs who bicycle into the different villages with lithium ion batteries and charge you 50 cents to charge up your phone because they're not on an electrical grid, but they do get data. So anyway, so this, this is the sort of population that we can reach uh, both with the learning app and with uh, the test center. So now let me just show you a demo of what the test center looks like. So we have two versions of the English test right now. Uh, we're working on other languages. Uh, one is the $20 certified test that uses security protocols, ID verification, uh, the camera and microphone on your device to actually record you taking the test to verify that you're not cheating and you are the person who you say you are. Um, for the purposes of this, so that we don't go through a 10-minute security setup, uh, I'll just do the free quick test, uh, which is a subset of the exercises. So this is one interesting exercise type that was a lot of fun to generate. Uh, you have to discriminate between real versus fake words in the language. So Bauer, I don't think it's a real word. Maid, mom, nost, little, centine, chich, shot, sorry. Uh, I think that's all of them. Um, whoop, can we, oh, is the audio up? Let's try that again. She has a small horse. All right, very useful phrase. Um, and then this is a close, uh, sort of fill in the blank, so not the least in the world. Uh, but pausing a moment, he added, still does not surprise me. After all, we uh, are only four miles from the coast, okay? We'll exercise each day. I will exercise each day. So more fake words, and as you can see, these are kind of more sophisticated words, because presumably I'm getting things correct. Anyway, I'm, I'm not going to go through the whole test. And the, <laughs> and the, uh, the whole test would take about 10 to 15 minutes uh, for the quick test. And the, the certified test actually is a superset of these different types of exercises. Uh, but for uh, various te technical reasons, uh, we omit them from the, the quick test. OK. So some design principles for, for the test center was to make it accessible, which we already talked about. Uh, question. You verify that it's a person, for example, typing in and not there's someone with another keyboard sitting there next to that person? Right, so, um, so we actually have a video of the, 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 the test taker 
taking the entire test and the screenshot. And we have human proctors that actually verify and watch every video post facto uh, to verify that everything that they're doing kind of lines up and makes sense. So look at the screen and pretend you're typing and there's someone sitting next to that person typing the real answers. So that could be possible for some exercise types. However, there are exercise types where you have to speak. It's really hard to fake that. Uh, so, um, so, so some of the evaluation types actually provide double as kind of a security protocol. So does 85%, do 85% of people have access to a mobile device that can record video and then? Uh, uh, so yeah, so that number's probably lower. Okay. There's an estimated, I, I think, two billion or so devices in the world uh, that can do that. Um, okay, so accessible, efficient, so we want to use this computer adaptive technology and test items that are kind of high return on investment. We get a lot of signal uh, without much effort on the part of the test taker. And then it, it, interfaces that are intuitive and also a, a scoring scale that is intuitive. Um, so for both the test takers and the people who would be using this for, for you know, uh, university admissions or job applications or uh, institutional uh, purposes. So the scale was designed uh, to correspond to the, something called the CEFR. Is anybody in the room familiar with this? Yeah, so we in machine learning and LP don't really tra traffic in this very much, but it's a growing, it's about a 20 year old, I think, scale uh, that divides speakers of a second language or any language uh, into basic, independent, and proficient, and then there's kind of a high low category for each of those. So there are these six different proficiency levels. So what we did was kind of design this score that maps to those six different levels, and then using machine learning and natural language processing technology can project arbitrary pieces of text onto this scale. Uh, so I was born in 1986 is a fairly basic thing that even a beginner should be expected to be able to say, whereas I believe his thoughts were nevertheless more rich and original is somewhat hoity-toity, but uh, you know, a more sophisticated use of the language. <clears throat> and uh, so I'm not going to go into the details uh, for all the different exercise types uh, of how we actually built these models, but I would like to focus on those vocabulary items because they were, they were fun. So the task here is to discriminate between real and fake English words. And this exercise has actually been around since the 1970s and various forms of it have been shown to be extremely predictive of real uh, ability use. And so our task was to take the skeleton of what had been worked on for the last several decades and wrap it into a computer adaptive testing framework. Uh, so in order to do this, we had these different subtasks, a gen an algorithm for generating the fake words, uh, for projecting them onto our difficulty scale that corresponds to the CEFR, and then adaptations of the scoring algorithms and generalizing item response theory in order to uh, facilitate those. So I'll talk about uh, the first couple bullet points here. So to generate the fake words, we just simply use a, a four-gram Markov chain model. So if, for those of you who are familiar with these kinds of things, you've got some uh, marginal probability over all characters that might begin a word, and you sample from that distribution. So T is a pretty common word, so we might start generating a word with T. Now, given that the previous word was T, uh, we have some information. What's the second letter going to be? Maybe a th. Uh, given it was the, it starts with the th. E seems like a likely uh, third letter, so on and so forth, until we hit some stopping criterion. And now we've generated the word self. All right, it's a fake word. It sounds pretty English-like. Um, we could also run this algorithm again and even start out with the same initial character, uh, but follow a different path, our second letter was TR, and we go down this trail to tractical. Uh, we could even start with TR again and run the algorithm and end up with something like Trumplicate, <laughs> which, I mean, I don't know about you, but I, that could be a real word, <laughs> especially right now. Um, so we can, we can run this algorithm, just synthesize hundreds of thousands of fake words and then filter out uh, all the words that actually occur in a very large corpus of real words and also filter out accidental offensive things, which happen. Um, 
And now to project these uh, words, both the real and the fake ones, onto our difficulty scale, uh, we just simply used a linear regression approach uh, as a function of word length, both characters and syllables, using acoustic models to predict how many syllables there would be, uh, as well as statistics from the Markov chain model, uh, for example, the Fisher score. So this is an approach used in bioinformatics, for example, for exploiting generative models in, in uh, discriminative uh, predictors. Uh, and then for real words, we also have empirical word frequency in a large corpus. And note that for all but this last one, these features are available for the fake words, too. So we can project both real and fake words onto the same scale. So for example, we, here are some real words, box and food. Those are very basic words, earn, fantastic, more, more sophisticated, all the way up to objectively and triumph. Those are kind of more native level uh, uses of the language. And we can also project fake words like self and DAC, if they existed, kind of short Anglo-Saxon looking uh, words. That if they existed, they would probably be high frequency. Or as contrig and trumplicate, or tractical and scrampy, you know, those, those words should exist, and they should be <laughs> in your everyday academic vocabulary. Um, and just as a point of validation, so the, the Cambridge, the creators of the IELTS uh, released this, uh, the Cambridge English Vocabulary Profile a few years ago based on ESL expert analysis of uh, the first certificate of English essays. Uh, and so they had about 7,000 words that they manually annotated as belonging to each of these CEF CEFR levels. Uh, and then he, these box plots sh show the predicted distributions under our model for words that belong to each of these categories. So the correlation is extremely high. Now, what's interesting to note is we do have some outliers. Like, this is a C1, which a, a C1, most everyone in this room is probably a C1 uh, or above. Uh, there, there could be a few internationals that are kind of at a high B2 level. Um, so so this is a, these are pretty sophisticated words, but yet our model predicts that it's kind of a beginner level word. Well, it turns out this was the word arms. So it's a polysemous word, and our model was assuming it was, you know, arms, uh, as opposed to like a call to arms or, you know, the, the uh, the king arms himself for battle. Uh, so it was a different sense of the word, which is the more sophisticated sense. But for the purposes of the real versus fake words, um, this, I would argue at least that the, the more basic sense is, is the one that matters in this case. So let's talk about the validity of the test. I've talked about how we generated it. So uh, these. These are the results from a study done at Carnegie Mellon University in Rwanda. Uh, so to take one of the existing tests is about a quarter of, a, of an annual salary, I think, in Rwanda. Um, so they, they didn't want to subject all of their applicants to their master's programs to, to pay that much money to take the test. So instead, they had them take the Duolingo test as part of their initial application process. But since the university still required TOEFL or IELTS scores, uh, then after the fact, they had them also uh, take the IELTS. <laughs> and the university actually paid for that. Uh, so that they're also um, motivated to you know, reduce their costs. Uh, so there was a sample of about 40 or so applicants that took both our test and the IELTS. And the correlation between them was extremely high. And we can able, were able to get a partial concordance mapping of what the scores mean. Take the IELTS if they took the Duolingo thing and then got right. it to the university. So everybody took the Duolingo test and submitted all of the rest of their application materials. And then the most promising candidates were, were asked to take the IELTS. That throws off the results, the fact that you were here. Yeah, so there's a sample bias here. That's definitely a limitation of the study is that the Duolingo score is partially informed who's, who's left in the sample. But if anything, you would think that restricted the range and would artificially deflate correlations, but the correlation is still pretty high. Um, even, uh, there was also a, an independent study done with the TOEFL even before we launched, uh, just with kind of our, our, our beta version. Uh, so a, an educational psychologist at University of Pittsburgh recruited some 300 people who had recently taken the TOEFL to take our test, and uh, here are the results. So there's also statistically significant correlations, even though 
it's not as tight. But something that's interesting to note is the ones that are off diagonal tend to be systematically be in the direction of low Duolingo scores, uh, but higher TOEFL scores. So if we were going to make uh, an error, I would prefer you know, for, the, for the errors to be in that direction. Do you know offhand what the uh, correlation is between like repeat test takers and the TOEFL within a short time? I don't know, and I, you know, I've looked at ETS research on that, and I could only find a paper from the early 90s, so it was before it was an internet-based test, so. Um, the, the test retest reliability of our test is about 0.8. Um, and there have been studies uh, correlating the, the IELTS and TOEFL to each other, and that's about 0.7. Uh, so it's a little bit higher than what we're seeing here. Um, and there was also this, this in interesting study done at DePaul University, which is a small liberal arts school in Indiana. So they do something interesting where all of their international students uh, go through a writing and an oral assessment during their first semester to determine whether or not they should take uh, any ESL support classes. <laughs> and they do this with all of their international students that are not native English speakers. And so this past year, and they're repeating the experiment this year, uh, when they brought them into the, the ESL or the English for Academic Purposes office um, to do these interviews, they also had them take the Duolingo test. And we find that uh, for each of the three, so there's a writing, an oral pronunciation, oral fluency, and oral, oral comprehensibility measures. And the, the test center score, uh, our score was more, at least as significantly correlated uh, as the TOEFL was. Now, there's also a difference here that those TOEFL scores are 12 months old or so, whereas our scores were ha being done at the same time. Um, but So in, in terms of adoption, uh, we've seen a lot of interest. The Harvard Extension School, interestingly, Harvard doesn't require uh, any of these tests because they have a very extensive network of alumni to do it, uh, interviews with international applicants. But for their continuing education programs through the extension school, they do require uh, proof of English ability. And they've recently started accepting the test. So has the Max Planck Institute uh, for radio, radio Astronomy and Carnegie Mellon University of Rwanda as a result of the study that I was talking about earlier. Uh, there are also large corporations uh, that are using it in various capacities to evaluate their own employees or their crowd workers um, and so on and so forth. And Another development that we're really excited about is a few months ago, Uber uh, launched a service called Uber English in certain parts of the world. So, for example, if you're vacationing in Colombia and you want to hail an Uber, but you don't speak or are not comfortable with your Spanish, and you want an English-speaking Uber driver, you can request one. And Uber is actually using the Duolingo Test Center uh, as the way of certifying the English language ability of those drivers. And. Uh, that's kind of all I've got right now. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions about anything I've talked about, as well as anything else about Duolingo. And note, we're hiring. So if you're interested in an internship or a job, if you're a couple of years shy of graduation, then uh, please apply. And I'll so I think I saw a hand right here. Two quick questions. Um, first, how does Duolingo use data to improve our understanding of linguistics in general? Um, I don't know if you guys do that, but it seems like you guys get a lot of data, so I'm wondering how do we understand language in better ways? And uh, then the other thing is, uh, do, you, do you have, is like the code for the fake English word generator, is that up somewhere? Uh, no, although, to be honest, that, the, the whole test center thing kicked off with a hackathon project. We had a 24-hour hackathon, and that's what I did for the hackathon. So you can probably sit down and do it in a couple of hours of Python. Um, now, as far as your first question, um, so we, there are a lot of interesting things using our data that you could consider in terms of general linguistics. We haven't thought about those questions as much as general language acquisition. Um, most of the work that we've been able to do has been fairly targeted toward our actual problems, like Im improving the course tree. So I've got a couple of backup slides.
that I could show you about a project that I didn't discuss looking at uh, error rates. So, so, so for each exercise, we can log how many students get things right or wrong and log and compile the mistakes that they made and try to discover patterns in the errors. So when I first joined the company, actually, for the first couple of months, what I did was work with the bilingual language experts who were curating each of the courses and go through each course one by one and do this sort of thing. So here we have, um, the, for English speakers learning French, uh, for this particular listening exercise, so this is when you listen to a prompt and you have to type in what you heard. Uh, the most problematic sentence was, tu es un garçon, and you can see a pattern, the, 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 the most common mistake uh, was just a misconjugation from the second person singular, or, yeah, second person singular to the third person singular, which are pronounced the same, and this is a listening exercise. Uh, the problem, and, and the same pattern is repeated uh, throughout most of the top errors. And the problem is, we were introducing il a and tu a in the same lesson, right? Uh, so even doing simple things, so homophones were a big problem with French, uh, you know, a, Li, noir, rouge, chat. Uh, so, so what we did was split up homophones uh, and then also contracted prepositions like you would say de la for of the, but if it's masculine, you would say du instead of de le. Uh, so these sorts of things were just confusing when you were introducing just a flood of too much information at once, which the original language designer being a fluent French speaker, you know, didn't really occur to him. Uh, so we were able to, to modify the course, make these sorts of changes to the actual skill tree, and then produce uh, you know, a, a better tree in terms of engagement. And we did this for all of the different language courses. So that's one example of ways that we've used our log data for, um, for improving SLA, in a sense. Is there, is there any gold standard uh, measure of proficiency in this area? So for example, you were talking about um, uh, the predictive power of the exercise of trying to identify fake words. Um, and so what's the independent measure of that? So, it's like, so that's correlated with some other evaluation. And right. I, guess, I guess another way of asking this is um, how can you figure out if Duolingo was a better predictor or assessor than, for example, the TOEFL exam? Right, so the question is, uh, is there a gold standard or, or if you were to try to measure our test, for example, against some other test, uh, what's the, dep the dependent variable you know, that you're comparing against? Um, so it, it kind of, th there's arguments, well, you gave the example of the real versus fake words, so different studies on that particular mode of a test uh, have looked at things like uh, IELTS scores or, or TOEFL scores as well as other uh, measures. Yeah, human, basically, humans have, have coded these individuals somehow, and then they take this automated test, and how well do, you know, does the test correlate with the human judgments? Uh, so in that sense, it's kind of closer to the DePaul University study uh, that we're trying to do. Actual faculty decided this student needs to go into this uh, remedial English course, uh, and our, our model does a pretty good job at predicting that. Um, so the thing is, it's just very difficult. It takes time, and it's expensive to run those studies. But those are things that we're looking into, you know, trying to do. And I think, yeah, there's another hand. Right here. Uh, so I think it's possible to rent people um, in Duolingo, and then you can compare your progress and stuff. Are you looking at or thinking about more ways um, to create some kind of social, social uh, interaction environment? Uh, since I think many language acquisition specialists would argue that that's essential to really learn something beyond simple recognition tasks. Right. So uh, the, the question is, what about social features and, and how do we use that? So we have some simple social features. You can friend people. There are leaderboards uh, among your, you know, your, your friends. Uh, we, in the past, have even had uh, features where you could 
challenge your friends and you would go through the same exercise and get points for getting things right and being the first person to get them right. In general, we have found that these social features are either go unused or if they are used, they're negatively correlated with engagement, uh, which is the kind of the opposite that most other gamified uh, things like photocracy or whatever uh, have found, which is kind of surprising to us. And, and uh, so it, that's kind of ha made us shy away from more of the, the social features, and we don't know why that is. It could be that uh, language as a means of communication, you know, if you fail or, you know, if, if in photography you, you know, you just don't do your 10 push-ups today, eh, who cares? But, like, if you come across looking like an idiot because uh, you were unable to, to communicate well, um, that's perhaps more embarrassing. And maybe that has something to do with why the social features, as we've experimented with them, haven't worked. But I, I absolutely agree that the automated tutoring system can probably get you to a B2 or so level, and then to really push into the C levels, uh, we need to reintroduce those social features. And we're thinking about how to do that, and we're even experimenting um, a little bit, but we don't have any answers yet. People uh, disengage might be that it's just harder to use it for social interaction. And since it becomes hard, they shy away from that. That's really not the reason to stop. It's right. Yeah, I agree. Uh, one last question. There's. Uh, when you began this talk, you were talking about how you can use the power of Duolingo to help translate a lot of pages. How does that actually get incorporated in Duolingo today, assuming it still does? Yeah, so it does. We've deprioritized it a little bit, but if you go to the website, then there's this tab that says Immersion. And what we see here, if I go to the Immersion tab, is a list of documents that are in French and need to be translated to English. So I don't think we have any paying customers translating from French to English, so most of these are uh, like Wikipedia articles that exist on the French Wikipedia, but not the English one. Um, and so we can go into this interface. Uh, and I think this has been mostly already translated. So this is kind of a wikified interface where maybe this is a bad example because that one's mostly translated. Um, So this, let's see, are there any blue? Yeah, right. so these blue sentences are things that haven't been translated at all. So I could get points for doing those translations. The gray ones have been translated by somebody, but we've got a, a suite of algorithms that kind of determines whether or not that translation is done or high enough of quality. Um, and the gray ones have not passed that threshold, whereas the, the black ones are done. I hear people giggling, so I don't know what. Um, What's funny up here? So, uh, right, so this is how we incorporate uh, the translations into the exercises. Uh, and some subset, I don't know the number off the top of my head, uh, but mostly people from Latin America learning English uh, do this, and that's actually where we make most of our revenue, is English-speaking media properties giving us articles every day to be translated into Spanish and Portuguese. Great. Well, um, thank you again. Thank you very much.